So let's ask ourselves, what is Rayleigh fading? And here's a picture of a base station and some houses and trees and the receiver. And if we had a situation where there's multiple paths that are bouncing off houses and coming to our receiver, uh, and maybe off trees as well, uh, and uh, in this case there's no direct path, then we're going to have at our receiver lots of versions of the signal coming with different delays. So let's think if we just had one sinusoid or one uh, symbol coming, this would be uh, one that comes for, and we're sending for a period of t, that's our symbol, uh, symbol length, then the next path would come with a delay. Uh, and what does that mean? If, if this number here, if this delay is small, delta t, if delta t is small in comparison to the symbol time, then we're just going to receive all the energy from both of these paths uh, in our received symbol. Now what does the different delays mean? They mean different phases. So this path here, which might come with zero phase offset, if we were sending binary signals in our constellation diagram, we're either sending a positive uh, or a negative sinusoid. This one's come with a time delay, uh, and what that is going to mean for us is at the constellation point for this one is going to be rotated. And because of the energy that's lost as it bounces off buildings, it's going to come with a different gain. So this this distance here is going to be a different to this distance, and the phase is going to be different. So it's going to be a different phase and a different amplitude. And I think you can see that if you have lots of them uh, all adding up, then for very small differences in movement of the mobile receiver, when you have lots of them adding up, there'll be lots of different phases uh, contributing to the overall phase that's received. So what does that mean? In a phaser diagram, we could draw a diagram of the phases. The, the, what we have here is the resultant is an equation that the received signal at time k equals the gain of the channel at time k times the symbol that was sent, which one of these symbols was sent at time k, uh, plus noise, of course. This is a communication uh, channel. Now here we've got this is the channel gain h of k, and it's going to be the addition of all of these phase offsets. Uh, so each phase offset uh, gives you could be drawn as a vector in the phase space, uh, maybe in zero phase offset, another one with a different one, and they're going to have different amplitudes because a different amount of the energy was absorbed uh, as it reflected on its path. So I'm just drawing lots of different phases here, all for different paths when we have multi-path. And if we have lots of paths, there's going to be lots of these uh, vectors. This is the real part. We'll call that the x direction and the imaginary part, the y direction. This is in phase and quadrature. Uh, and we know that we're sending signals with an in phase component and a quadrature component uh, for standard modulation. So this is each individual one drawn, uh, but of course they're going to be all added up because they're all adding up in the air, and so the resultant waveform is the addition of all of these. So I could draw this on a phasor diagram, uh, which would be the addition of all of those phasors to give us a resultant one. So there'll be one there and this one. I'm just going to take each one of these and, and draw them uh, one after the other, adding uh, on because they're all adding up and the phases add uh, as they do for all the different phases of the signal, and it gives you one overall resultant amplitude and phase, amplitude r and phase theta. And that is the value hk here. Complex number, it's got an amplitude and a phase, or an x component and a y component. And when you've got lots of these adding up, because there's lots of paths, and if, if there's no one path that dominates, so all of them are roughly speaking coming with similar amplitudes, of course they're all random uh, because they've hit different buildings and different trees and so on, but there's no one that dominates, then you get a picture like we've drawn here. And we'd like to know what is the distribution of this vector here because we, in our receiver we'd like to know what's, what typical powers are we going to receive and what typical phases. And when there's lots of them we have a central limit theorem result that says that if you add up lots of random variables then uh, the resultant random variable of the overall is a Gaussian. And so if we 
suggest that they're going to be uh, a Gaussian in the x direction and a Gaussian in the y direction. So the x component is random and has a Gaussian shape of probability density and the y direction is random and has a Gaussian shape for probability density. Then uh, we have these two pictures here. And so this is the x and the y, and if we consider them to be independent, they're in the x, the orthogonal directions, the in phase and quadrature, which are orthogonal directions. So we consider if they are um, uh, independent, then the overall combined PDF is the multiplication of the two. And we have a picture here, uh, I'll try and draw a two-dimensional picture here of a, uh, a typical uh, shape for this, where it's Gaussian in both directions. So this is probability density vertically, and this is the x direction and the y direction. And so we've got a Gaussian shape uh, hill here. And so it's a symmetric hill um, that we have here uh, with sort of circular contour lines around the hill. Okay, so this is our overall combined joint density function. Now, if we change variables to r uh, and theta, we've got r equals x squared plus y squared square root, and theta equals the inverse tan of y divided by x, then we can do a change of variables from the joint PDF, which was in x and y, from multiplying two Gaussians together into r and theta. And so the joint PDF of r and theta uh, would be uh, equal to the modulus of the Jacobian matrix. And I won't do this here, but I'll leave that to you to uh, search up um, of x and y to these probability densities here. Uh, and so this is the Jacobian, that's a j, sorry. Uh, so this, you can do that change of variables and you'll find out that the, and then you can marginalize them to get the distribution of the radius. So the p r of r and p uh, theta of theta and you'll find that this is a uniform between 0 and 2 pi so all angles are equally likely and this shape here looks like this and this shape this this continues on here uh, and this shape here is the Rayleigh distribution so this is finally where we get to understanding the Rayleigh fading. So it comes about from an assumption that you have lots of paths all adding up, that the real and the imaginary components of those paths are independent and Gaussian, and that leads you to having a, an, a phase which is uniform, so this is that's why this was circular, and if you look at the top of this mountain it's a circle, uh, circular contour lines, and an amplitude distribution, so for the, for the R value here, which is the distance from the origin, which has the shape which is a Rayleigh function. And this equals r divided by sigma squared, where the sigma comes from the Gaussian distribution, e to the minus r squared divided by 2 sigma squared. And this is the Rayleigh distribution, why it's Rayleigh fading. One final thing to point out, sometimes it's a confusing, or people can get confused here, by seeing a two-dimensional uh, shape here for the PDF uh, of this of h. Uh, in terms of x and y, where there's a peak at the middle. And then when you draw that PDF or represent it in terms of the, uh, the r and the theta, which is the same thing, you're just representing it in different, uh, different coordinates, that in the center at r equals 0, this curve comes to 0. So at this, in this drawing, the, P, the density of probability is a maximum at the, at the middle, when x equals 0 and y equals 0, whereas here, when r equals 0, it's at 0. So sometimes this is, uh, it's, it's certainly counterintuitive when you look at those two pictures, and sometimes it's confusing. Uh, but the best way to think of that, if you have been confused by that, is think of a particular value of r. Let's pick this one here. And we'll think, well, how, what's the height of that in relation to this picture up here? So you work out the probability by taking the value at r plus, uh, and, and then another value which is a little bit further along, r plus delta r, you probably remember this from calculus, uh, and then the area of this is the probability of getting that value of r, and the area is the height multiplied by the base width. Okay, so what does that translate over to here? Well, when you pick a value of r, you go out a certain value of r along here, and then r plus delta r on this picture is actually 
a circle on the base uh, of equal radius. So that's a circle of e equal radius, which corresponds on the curve here to being uh, the, uh, you're going to be integrating, so you're taking the, the height times the base. So now you've got a circle here on this diagram. So this small bit of delta r here on the Rayleigh curve corresponds to this, this whole circle here on the x and y representation. And so you're averaging, you're taking the height of that circle, and the, when you're, uh, which has a, a width dr, uh, and then all of that uh, area from this two-dimensional version uh, picture up here in the x and y, all of that added up is this height here on the uh, marginal density function in terms of r. So that's that's what you're getting. That's how you're relating these two pictures. Okay. So the when you take a, a, for a particular value of r on the two-dimensional, that means you're taking a circle uh, which has a, a width, uh, and then then you're taking the area of all of the height under that uh, or above that uh, circle. And so let's think of that in the limit then as r goes to zero. So as r goes to zero, this circle gets smaller and smaller, and the area above it gets less and less. And so when it's when r is very close into the center, the circle is very small, and you're, you've only got a very small base. So this value here is going to be for a small distance along here of r, you've only got a very small base in this two-dimensional. And in the limit, of course, as r goes to zero, this base goes to zero. And so even though there's a peak in the two-dimensional height in terms of x and y here, when you multiply by the base, which is zero, you get the zero coming here in the Rayleigh function. So that's that hopefully explains if there was confusion uh, the, the, and makes it um, uh, the link between this the representation in terms of r and theta where there's where the Rayleigh function comes to zero for r equals zero in comparison to the x and y which has a peak uh, at zero in each case but it is consistent for that reason so that's Rayleigh fading so please like the video if you found it useful it helps others to find it uh, subscribe to the channel for more videos and check out the web page which has a full categorized listing of all of the videos